Well, hello everybody. This is uh, Ifrit Lainan speaking to you, and I'm coming to you live on PageCast, which is a podcast uh, brought to you by Jonathan Ball Publishers. In this episode, we are focusing on Boris Gorelick's recent book, A Russian on Commando, The Boer War Experiences of Yevgeny Augustus, which was published by Jonathan Ball in August 2022. Our two discussants today are Boris Gorelick and Professor Franz Johan Pretorius. So I just briefly want to introduce these two gentlemen to you. Boris Gorelick is a Russian writer and scholar who has done extensive historical research in South Africa. He's also a senior research fellow at the Center for Southern African Studies at the Institute for African Studies of the Russian Academy of Sciences located in Moscow in Russia. Now, Boris is the editor of the newly released book, A Russian on Commando, which we will be talking about for the next half an hour or so. And then Professor Franchian Pretorius is an Emeritus Professor of History from the Department of Historical and Heritage Studies at the University of Pretoria. His field of research is in the Anglo-Boer War, and he has written or edited eight books on the war. Most of them were published in both Afrikaans and English. He is also the editor of A History of South Africa from the Distant Past to the Present Day that was published by Protea Books in 2014. He has received several awards for his work and was also the runner-up of the Sunday Times Alan Payton Award for his book, Life on Commando during the Anglo-Boer War, 1899 to 1902, which was published by Human and Rousseau in 1999. So gentlemen, welcome to this podcast, and I look forward to interacting with you both over the next half an hour or so. Thank you, Phil. So let's jump straight into it. And uh, my first question is to you, Boris. Can you uh, briefly introduce Yevgeny Augustus to our listeners? Who was he? Where did he come from? And most importantly, what motivated him to travel to South Africa to join the Boer cause and fight in the Anglo-Boer War? Well, Yevgeny uh, Augustus was a young uh, Russian officer who um, was... Um, I think it was a, quite a romantic figure because uh, he mentions in his uh, book, in his in his accounts, that uh, he was inspired by uh, adventure novels you know, by Thomas Main Reed and then Louis Boussinard. Um So, so he had those those romantic ideas of Africa, and uh, then uh, he, on learning about the anglo boer War. Uh, the beginning of the anglo Boer War, he decided to, um, he became very inspired and he wanted wanted to go uh, and help uh, the uh, Republican cause. Also, uh, not, not just for those idealistic reasons, but also because he was, as a military man, as a soldier, he thought that uh, a war with Britain was imminent and he thought that, they, uh, that he needs to, to gain experience so that he could be useful in this in, in those future wars with Britain. Um, so he spent about ha half a year in South Africa. He arrived in January uh, uh, year 1900 and uh, he eventually stayed until um, well un I think until, uh, until June uh, the same the same year when he was wounded on the battlefield and was captured by the British. Eventually, he was released on parole and was allowed to um, return to Russia, where he wrote his memoir. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I think um, what I found quite quite fascinating about Yevgeny was that uh, you write in the book that he was he was quite a gifted writer. So the whole yeah. run up to to Yevgeny actually arriving in South Africa is so fascinating because he describes his whole journey to South Africa in such great detail. That you almost feel that you're with him, you know, traveling in the train carriage all the way through Europe, all the way to Belgium, and then onwards to South Africa. So I really find that very interesting. But my my next question is for for you, Francois, and and I really want to know if Yevgeny's motivations to join the Boer cause would correlate with those of the other foreign foreign volunteers who fought in the Anglo-Boer War. Was he unique, or was he just part of the? Uh, you know, all of the foreign volunteers, that they all, all share these same ideals for coming to South Africa. Yes, thank you, Effort. Um, I would just, just like to add to Boris's issue uh, and yours of uh, 
Evgeny traveling through Europe. You know, he came from war. He was his, his regiment was in Warsaw, and he traveled through Berlin, Cologne, and then eventually Brussels to to meet Leitz there, the Doctor Leitz, the Transvaal plenipotentiary there, and then eventually going down to uh, uh, along the uh, the coast to to Lorenzo Marx. And this part of his description and. Also, their the, uh, experiences in Paris, for instance, is so a wonderful setting because all the other volunteers that we have do not cover that. They start when they arrive in Lorenzo Marx. So this was something very special, I think, that we know how these guys got together. They were five Russians eventually. They went to Madagascar and from there to Lorenzo Marx. So, yes, uh, uh, I, I just wanted to add that to give more flavor to, uh, to, to Yevgeny's uh, wonderful description. Now, his idea was to, uh, to, to go and fight because he was in a regiment. He had, hadn't been in, in any uh, contact, skirmishes or anything. And he thought, well, this is an ideal opportunity because many of the Russians were not uh, pro-Boer. Many of them didn't even know where the Transvaal was, but it was a, an issue of the British, they're our enemy, and we therefore pro-Boer. And we are going to have a, sooner or later, we're going to have a big war with Britain. So we better prepare ourselves. And, and, and this links up with another issue where the um, the Russians particularly thought of adventure. It was very romantic. They can make a name for themselves. Um, there's also this issue of the end of the century mood in Europe. You know, it, it was a contrast. On the one hand, Europe was very optimistic because people thought they were very good and improving. But on the other hand, there was a somber mood as well, a, uh, that the world was closing in on them. And going out and enjoy yourself as a young man and make a name for yourself, that is what, what, what Evgeny thought he would do, and the other Russians as well. Uh, so linking up with these, with these farmers, the Russians uh, hadn't had could relate to the Boer farmers themselves, uh, fighting the mightiest empire of the time and uh, the state of the time. So yes, in general, they all felt the same. The Russians, obviously, that differed from the Dutch and German and uh, uh, well, their uh, volunteers. Most of those Dutch and German volunteers had already been here in the Transvaal before the outbreak of the war. Mm. But some of them came particularly for the kinship with their uh, family relationship with the Boers. And they thought the Boers were Afrikaans-speaking Dutchmen, which they, of course, were not. And so they were quite uh, alarmed when they found that the Boers were not exactly Dutchmen. But anyway, so yes, an anti British feeling for the Russians and for the Germans in, to a certain extent and for the French. But the idea of heroism, adventure, that was the first issue. No, that's that's fascinating. Um, just to latch onto that, but I don't want to get too ahead of myself, is... Um, uh, uh, can I just is, add something as yeah, well? Yeah, 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 absolutely. Okay, so this part about um, Evgeny traveling to Africa. I didn't really know if, if this would, uh, you know, add value to the account. I, th I just thought, you know, for, to me personally, it was interesting. But now I realize that it was, well, if not unique, at least it was rare hmm. to have this description in a, in a volunteer's, foreign vo volunteer's account. Um, I thought that all those details that, that, that he adds, how, how people in the countries that he traveled through in Europe, how they saw this conflict and how they reacted to it and how they reacted to the fact that, that he and his, his comrades 
were traveling to, to South Africa to sacrifice maybe their, their lives or their health to uh, a cause of the people that none of them knew personally. I think I think to me that 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 was a fascinating part of the part of this account, of course, um, and the fact that he he, he describes this this incident when when they were I think in France and they were staying in a hotel and when they were leaving and they they they, they told the hotel owner that they were they were they were going to fight for the Boers and she started crying as if they, they were her children. You see, so this I'm I'm, I'm in in uh, Evgenia, uh, Evgenia's account, for me, the most fascinating part is this human emotion that that you can feel, and that and that, and it brings the whole story alive. It brings this war. It 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 adds color to to the to those events, even to for those people who are not necessarily uh, know very much about about this war. It. It becomes so vivid, I think, and fresh. Yes, and to add to that, you know, you find that people think war is about generals. War is about soldiers. The yes. everyday experience of these people. And he, he portrays that so wonderfully well. Yes, yes. No, absolutely. And, and just the, the point that I wanted to make, um, coming back to the foreign volunteers, was the the eclectic bunch that they were eventually that uh, was around that that surrounded Yevgeny uh, uh, later on um uh, there was Italians there were Portuguese there were some Prussians there were a whole uh, collection of these men that joined together under the banner of the Russians so I think it's um you know we sometimes polarize to the idea that the foreign volunteers were either Dutch or German or Irish or Russian but we forget that they that there were many different um foreign volunteers that actually also fought in the war. That's right. And it, it also brings this international aspect to the to to our understanding of the war, because you can see all of a sudden that this war meant something even for those people living in Russia, which when Russian Russian Empire wasn't involved in the in the conquest of Africa and this you know, in, in, in the colonial effort of European powers, but uh, still it evoked such strong emotional response in, the, in, the, in those people, which means that it's not purely, it's not this, the Boer War is not purely, it's not a purely South African matter or a purely um, a fight between the British Empire and, and the African the republics. It, it's it's much broader than that, and that's I think what uh, this account reminds us of. Yeah, yeah, that's true. So my next question, Boris, um, would be: Could you just give us a, a brief overview of Yevgeny's experiences in South Africa during the war, from when he actually arrives in Pretoria to uh, to his experiences serving on the front line with uh, the Krugersdorp Commando? Just to sort of sketch. Uh, you know, because this is the the majority of the of the book actually is, is about his time on the front line, and and it's so vividly portrayed in his writing. But can you just give us an idea of of, of his experiences? Yes. So he um, there's actually not much uh, in in his account. There's not much uh, written about the actual fighting, but the the combat experience. It's more life on commando or um, the kind of impressions that a foreign volunteer had of um, of the Boers and uh, their attitudes and um, their tactics and so and so on. So um, he he uh, and his comrades, other people who travelled with him um, from uh, from Russia, arrive in Pretoria, and then they give an oath um, of allegiance to um, the um, South African Republic and they um, join Republican forces and they decide to go to the Natal Front. Um, they uh, take part in the Battle of, of Tugela and um, they, then he describes a big withdrawal of uh, Boer troops. Um, then they um, arrive to the site where uh, General 
uh, Louis Boiter's camp was, and then they decide to form a Russian core, uh, a separate Russian unit, um, consisting of not, not just Russian nationals, but also some Europeans. Some people from Western Europe, some volunteers from Western Europe, some volunteers from Central Europe, and uh, also some uh, Jewish people. Uh, sometimes it's been written that uh, those Russian volunteers were all very anti-Semitic. Uh, that might be the case, but but there's some some Jews were also part of the of this Russian core. And uh, then um, eventually they are transferred to uh, the Free State, the Orange Free State, and they. Um, uh, they're based there. They, um, but they never. The, the Russian core never never gets a chance to uh, take part in, uh, in um, any fighting because uh, the Boer troops at that time, at, at that front, at that 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 part of uh, South Africa didn't didn't actually uh, didn't actively didn't didn't there, there were no major battles there, and uh, and um, actually. Uh, the Evgeny's account uh, ends there because he didn't. I think he didn't feel, feel comfortable describing his experiences in the in the Russian core because they were quite controversial. Uh, so at the end of the book, I I take up from there and I describe the rest of his experiences in uh, in South Africa and uh, he's captured by the British and uh, his return to Russia and his career military career yeah. after that already in the Russian Empire. Yes. May I add to that, uh, effort? Um, I want to uh, just read a passage from, from Yevgeny's uh, experiences. It's, it's really the core of his, of his six months there. He said, for six solid months, I fought side by side with the Boers, lay with them in the trenches. Their blood and brains clotted my eyes when deadly shrapnel struck comrades close by. Together, we endured all the deprivations and adversities of commando life. They shared their last rusks, their last sips of water with me, and I learned to love and respect these stern and unfriendly-looking, childishly good-natured, wholeheartedly courageous and profoundly religious men. That sums it up, and this is what makes this book so fascinating. Yes, absolutely. I, sh I share that conviction. It's, uh, <laughs> it's, it's like Boris said, it, it does not really talk much about the actual fighting, but the strength of the book is where all the detail lies of life on commando. And, uh, and, and Evgeny was really, truly talented in the way that he, he wrote all of this down. But Franchuan, I want to ask a question, uh, a further question about the foreign volunteers, because in the book it, it's it, it's quite clear that they were a diverse and cosmopolitan bunch from all walks of life, former officers and adventure seekers and those opportunists that also uh, find themselves in the in, in the middle. But I'm quite curious as to what prompted these um, foreign volunteers to organise themselves into their own independent cause, like the the Germans or the Dutch or the Russians, and then also how how successful were they and how much has been written about these foreign volunteer corps? Right, so there were a few uh, 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 national uh, corps, like for the Irish Brigade, and most of them were American Irish who, who'd been uh, uh, working on the mines, the gold mines in, 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 the, uh, in, in the Johannesburg area when the war broke out. And being Irish, they were anti-English and therefore they joined the war. The Italians uh, under Ricciardi, they've also felt, well, we've got something to say and improve. Um, there were some French who wanted to be on their own, uh, a, a kind of a foreign legion. Uh, particularly under de Vibois Moreau, and he was asked by, by Pitt Hubert in March uh, 1900 to form a foreign legion with these people. And eventually, um, uh, just over half of the foreign volunteers were in these uh, uh, corps. The others were with the commanders as individuals. But then the Scandinavians were almost wiped out at Magersfontein on the 11th of December, 1899. And the individuals who remained, they went into individual commandos. 
the same happened with the, the, the Dutch Hollander Corps. They were also uh, uh, really uh, uh, almost wiped out at Elands Laagte uh, at the beginning of the war. And the, the rest of them went into, in, as individuals into commandos. There was the German Corps and the Germans also wanted to be on their own. Um, Jürgen doesn't like the Germans. There was a wonderful, <laughs> he's got a long, wonderful sense of humor. Humor, He said, they are, are you know, they, they act as if they had just um, written the, uh, the final word of a, a treaty against the French or something like that. You will remember Boris better than I do. But, you know, so yes, they wanted to be on their own, but most of these calls were not successful and the individuals went there, they, therefore went into the commandos. But in, in general, their, 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 um, their success was not very great because they basically irrit irritated the Transvaal government with many demands, particularly of the adventurers. And they were yeah. very unfortunate or un unhappy when they couldn't get horses anymore or saddles from the Transvaal government. And they irritated the Boers. The Boers said, what is all your, and that's now not the, um, the ones, the officers who were serious about fighting for the Boers, but many of these adventurers, the, the Boers said, "What your 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 book knowledge means nothing. You can't even ride a horse." So uh, the Boers had a lot of contempt for these guys who just did not uh, uh, participate and contribute to the war effort. Um, some of these, and and Yevgeny is very strict about these ones, who would drive around in Pretoria uh, with, uh, uh, using the, the money the government gives to them for staying in, in hotels and not going to the front. So yes, it's, it's, it's a diverse group, but in the end, their contribution wasn't that big, except the Foreign Legion. They fought at Bosworth at the beginning of April 1900, where Divi Bois was killed but their contribution was was not great. Yes. No, thanks and then, for that. As, uh, in the, uh, you wrote a paper, I'm talking about it to, to uh, Professor Pretorius, uh, Welcome But Not well, Quite Welcome, is it, was, was no. that the title? So welcome it's, But Not That Welcome, yes. Not yes, That yes. Welcome. Yeah, no, so it's, it's, in, it's, it's in this book by Kruger and Lefson, uh, war volunteers in modern times, something That's like right. that. Yes. Uh, so yes. Right. <laughs> but but uh, Evgeny had no problem with that. Unlike many other volunteers who, who actually complained, they thought you know yeah. we, we we're not valued enough. We're not uh, our, you know our sacrifice, our willingness to fight for you, uh, unknown people <laughs> to us. You know, um, you you you. you, you you know why? Why are you so unfriendly? But but Evgeny had no had no problem with that, and he, he and he even I don't know tried to flatter the Boers by saying I came to learn from you, which which he did in fact he he did learn uh, learn um, a lot of things from them. And later when he returned to Russia, he became um, in, uh, he was in charge of um, um, a scouting unit uh, in Siberia. Where they explored the uh, Russian um, Chinese uh, border, and uh, they also conducted a few raids there. Uh, so he did use his his experience. But what I'm saying is that he understood why uh, why the Boers uh, di di did not quite welcome all these uh, people, all these diverse people. Yes, yeah. there's for instance the Dutch volunteer Hendrik Verloren van de Maart. He, he understood very quickly that you should, you should try and understand the Boer in his environment. Don't, mm. don't, don't accept that he is a Dutchman like you are. Um, see their strong points and ignore their weak points. For instance, their lack of discipline. That was, you will remember, <laughs> Boris, you... Uh, 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 Yevgeny uh, emphasizes this quite a lot, the lack yeah. of discipline in the Boer forces while they were there. And he says later on, 
yes, after the war, after the period when we had left, that improved, and that was indeed the case. But during the first seven, eight, ten months of the war, the lack of discipline was really, really a problem for the Boers. Yeah. No, thank you for that. And then, um, Boris, next question. Um, I want us to, to go back a little bit because you did mention it uh, before, but can you please elaborate a bit more on the formation of the Russian Corps? And then what what do you consider the main driving factors were behind the decision of, of Yevgeny and his comrades to actually form their own independent corps? And then uh, lastly, how long did it exist for and what led to the eventual disbandment of this uh, Russian Corps? Uh, they formed this corps, I think, because they were unhappy with... Um, many of them were unhappy with um, the... the um, Boer's treatment of, of, of uh, volunteers, their lack of discipline, and they thought they would do better on their own. They, they even, uh, you can even write that they wanted to show, to, to give an example to the Boers of a, you know, good conduct on the uh, on the military, on the on the battlefield, you know, good order and, and all that. Um, and yes, so they, they wanted to have freedom, they wanted to have independence so that they could uh, do, th do things on their own the way they, they thought that um, they, should, they should be done. Um, you know, most of those people were uh, professional military men and they had professional military training, so they, they thought they, they would be able to do better, but, they, but, it, but it, 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 it never happened because they, they um, first during that, that month or so that, that the, the Corps existed, they only took part in several skirmishes. Uh, they had many members who were, uh, I think, uh, more interested in, in, in plundering or in disorderly behavior and drinking and, and having fun than and, and, and fighting. And um, so they, 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 there was this um, struggle for leadership in this, in this tiny unit of, of uh, at most uh, 30 people. Um, so um, eventually, eventually it, it broke up and, it's, uh, and I think it's a wasted opportunity because maybe they could if, if, if they saw action, if they got, got a chance to see, to see action, maybe, maybe they could con uh, contribute. And uh, in, in, in some way, but we, we never know. And, and May I just add something? Yes. Uh, if it, um, we are talking about volunteers, how many? Um, you know, it's, we do not know how exactly how many volunteers there were. Breitenbach, the Afrikaans uh, official uh, historian on the war, reckons that there were about 2,000, whereas uh, Michael... In Dabbitt, total, the, uh, in Irish, about the total number, not, not just Russians, the yeah, total yeah, number total of numbers, Russians. Yes, 2,000, and then Michael Davitt says uh, it must be between 3,400 and 4,000. And oh. then Hillegas, the American writer, says 2,675. And if, <laughs> if, if his figure is correct, it means that we had about 225 Russians. And I'm not sure whether Boris agrees with that, but we don't know how many Russians we there know. were. I don't know how they calculated that. I don't know how they, how they came up with this number. Yeah. Yeah, that is, uh, it, it's, it's un unfortunately, we, we, we do not know. We don't, we don't know. Well, I can, uh, as far as I know, there were, among the people who came to South Africa, especially uh, to, 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 to be on the Boer side after the beginning of the war, there were several dozens of uh, medical personnel. Can we count them as volunteers? Well, maybe yes. We, yes, we can, and uh, and maybe um, maybe about fifty to sixty people who took part in battle as soldiers, combatants, um, and that's. I think these are the only people we, we we only know the names of these people. So let's say maybe maybe in total that will be over a hundred people. But of course, there, there, there are many people who are, who, whose names have never been, were, ne were never recorded or were never identified. 
and recently I just identified a few, a few, a few, a few other vol uh, volunteers that are not even mentioned in uh, this uh, seminal work by professors Davidson and Filatova, Russians in the anglo boer War. So we keep on making those small discoveries, but still, I mean, there were there were there were, there were, there were very few, and I'm sure that uh, that number that uh, the um, Irish journalist came up with, uh, it, it includes Jewish um, immigrants in, in, uh, in the Transvaal and the Boer Republics who had come long before the war, at least since the early 1890s. Yes. No, that, thank you for that. Um, just, to, just to latch onto this, um, can you Boris, comment on the leadership dispute within the Russian core, because I found that quite interesting between uh, Maximov and uh, I forget the name of the Ganetsky. other. Ganetsky. Ganetsky and Ganetsky. Yes. Uh, I found that quite interesting. And then um, just lastly, can you just um, elaborate on why do you think Yevgeny did not really write about this last phase of, of, of the war, of the existence of the Russian core? Yeah, well, I think he didn't. He didn't. Uh, he didn't write about it because he thought he, he also thought it was a wasted opportunity. Maybe he was he was a bit embarrassed how it all about how it all ended. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and uh, and there were also some people that he didn't want to name. Um, he even in 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 his writings in in his publications he never he never gave full names of Russian volunteers that that he fought with, uh, only their initials. Um, so um, there was this, this dispute between um, a very dashing and ambitious Russian volunteer and a, an officer who came uh, several months after, uh, he arrived in South Africa several months after, uh, after Evgeny and who, uh, you know, because he was very dashing and, and very ambitious and he had this um, mm, the air of, of an important person. So he made um, Boer leaders listen to him and take him take him seriously. So he decided to um, he came came up, came up with this idea to form the unit uh, to form a, a Russian core and uh, he rallied up uh, support rather he, he um, organized it. And then um, another much more experienced uh, volunteer, uh, Colonel Evgeny Maximov, um, uh, confronted him and, sa and said, well, wait a second, but we traveled with Genetsky, we traveled on the, on the ship, and I gave him this idea, and I wanted to be in charge of this unit because I'm a, I'm a colonel. Uh, so Ganesky and Ganesky said, "No, it's it's already it's already done. I'm I formed the unit. I'm I'm, I'm already in charge." And he didn't want to get to to step down. He didn't want to get to to give up. And um, at that at that time, um, and he started spreading rumors. Actually, that was it was it was a fact that that uh, uh, for some uh, for for several years, Maximov was served in um, in secret police. Russian secret police, and so he was a policeman, not a not a military man. He wasn't wasn't a combatant like that, which 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 was partly true because he did serve in um, in secret police, but he, he had also ta taken part in uh, several wars, uh, both in Russia and in Central Europe, and he led volunteer uh, volunteer units there. So he had very rich experience there, but. He failed to win the mobile, win win over the uh, those Russian volunteers, and um, so they were led by this ambitious and, and dashing man who apparently couldn't control them well, he, and uh, so the, the mission failed, and the, and the unit fell uh, fell apart. Yeah, yeah. It didn't. I think I think he didn't want to tell to tell this story, but now we know. You know, we have. I mean, I told this story in the, in the upload. Yeah, <laughs> I did it. Yes. Him. yes, yes. <laughs> And then um, just to latch onto that, um, maybe Francois can also come in on this one. That in the book it appears that Mark, uh, that that Colonel Maximov actually had quite a good relationship with the Boer leadership. Um, I picked it up in a few pages because it seemed that he he had quite a connection with some of the senior Boer leaders, as opposed to Ganetsky. Um, and I found that quite fascinating because he he would have had more. Um, 
uh, he would have held probably more esteem with the Boer leadership, this uh, Russian colonel. Yes, he indeed was, was, was very good in his relations. And he, he knew that th the important thing is to, to make friends with the people at the top, with F.W. Reitz, the state secretary. Yeah. And uh, that was very important because uh, Reitz regarded this guy, Maximov, as somebody we must, we must uh, nurture for our cause. Yes, it, that's, that's correct, yes. Mm. And then um, following on that, uh, Francois, this question is for you. Um, now, nearly 120 years on since the end of the Anglo-Boer War, the war remains very popular among the public and academics. And this is in South Africa. And as we, we can see now, uh, further afield as well, even in Russia. So what would you say are the reasons for this continued fascination with the war? And can you identify any areas that still deserve further historical attention? Um, for Afrikaners, the, the war is something that they can latch onto, having lost political power in 1994. And just five years after that, in 1999, there was the, the centenary of, of the Boer War, of the Anglo-Boer War. So there was another opportunity to, to tell the world, hey, look what we did. We stood up against the mightiest empire in the world, and we're not as bad as you think we are. And it, 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 uh, like in the 1930s and 40s, it once again boosted Afrikaner thought. In the 30s and 40s, it boosted Afrikaner nationalism. Now that nationalism is no longer with us, but there's a patriotism there that Afrikaners feel, hey, we, you must take note that we, were also, we also suffered like black people in this country. And, and, and that is a very important issue because you find, well, I find that many Afrikaners nowadays think of the concentration camps and the fate of the people there, but they don't know the, the exact facts of, of that. They just want to talk about that and they've got emotions. And that's why writing about that is so important to, to, to indicate that this is a very nuanced war. That it's not, uh, everything is not clear cut. And yeah. there are new issues that we can write about. Obviously, lately, there's a, a lot has been written about black participation or black experience in the yes. war, which is fantastic because they were also in concentration camps. And there is still some work there, but the British documents are not so well preserved on the black concentration camps as in the white camps. There are issues that can be done. There are still some Boer generals, General... Chris Muller, who knows about him? Uh, you know, they're Pitful Yun. I've just read a manuscript of a book on coming on of Pitful Yun, General Pitful Yun. And there are others that still need attention. And, and, and then obviously issues that are important around, around uh, the religion, because we think that all the Boers, we have the notion that all the Boers were religious men eight feet tall, which is not the case. So there are issues that we can go into more nuances and say, yes, but. Yes. No, thank you very much for that. I think, uh, yes, yeah, yeah, so, go, so go for it. Okay. So I'm an outsider, right? So I'm looking up from the outside, looking in to your <laughs> to the South African situation. And uh, so for me, there, there are two things that, that, were very important about about this memoir and in South Af and and the Anglo Boer War and South African War in general. So first thing is, I'm both a historian, and but I'm also a reader, and um, I'm not a military historian. My my interest is mostly in in cultural links between Russia and South Africa throughout the centuries, and how those the, the, those links and perceptions and attitudes influence um, historical processes. So, um, and, I, and I get bored very easily when I, when I read, uh, you know, if it's not on my, on my topic, if it's not something to do with, with, with my research. And when I was reading all, you know, several accounts by Russian volunteers, and then I came across this one, 
by Evgeny Augustus. And I thought, well, that's something amazing because I'm not interested in, in the small details, little details of warfare. I'm interested in how people felt on the battlefield, what, what it was like to be there in that one, the first war of the 20th century. Um, a war of this, an event of inter, an international scale, dimensions. And how, what, what is it to be on the battlefield in general? Not just you know, the war war, but in general. And I think Evgeny shows it so vividly, this wartime experience. For me, it was something like what Peter Jackson did with uh, in a documentary called "We um, We Shall We Shall Never Die." Or is that, is that, is that, is that, he did a, he did a documentary on the on the First World War. Peter Jackson of the mm. Lord of the Rings fame. So what he did is that he, is he, he it, it's a documentary made from um, footage, archival footage from the First World War, but he colorized it. And he added soundtrack, so that all, suddenly it all comes it comes alive. So it all starts as a black and white, you know, black and white film, and then suddenly color appears, and it's a, it's a shock in a in a good sense. You know, you're, you're so excited. Oh, but I can I can relate to these people. I can relate to these events. Oh, this guy I know. I, well, I don't know him, but I can imagine that I know someone like him. You know, so for me, it's it, it's it's the same kind of thing. All that that um, book that Jonathan Ball just brought out a few a few months ago, and it's a bestseller as far as I know. Um, the Anglo-Boer War in Color. It's also something like that, an, an attempt to 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 make it not just relevant but tangible. You know, something that that you can relate to. And I think it's it, it this this event or the Anglo War is something that that people it's, it's, it, it can't be just part of ancient history. Another thing is what I experienced in South Africa. I'm talking to to many Afrikaners, some of them are almost embarrassed about their embarrassed of their history. They are some say oh, some of them are, are almost ashamed. And I told them, well, what are your heroes? Who are your heroes? Mandela. Oh yes, but here is your own people. Who? Brown Fisher. But what about others? Paul Kruger, is he a, is he a hero? Is he someone worth respecting or maybe admiring even? I don't know. Jan Smuts? Well, we don't know. But how, what 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 is a nation? What what is a people that doesn't have heroes? You know, historical fig, uh, heroes who did good things, who did, who did bad things. There's a uh, like Paul McCartney is saying, um, there, there is good and bad in, in everyone. Well, yeah, yes, it is. But we should remember what's, why this person is important. He did bad things, we remember about that. But what's what, what is important is this, for instance, what, what I think I would admire is that, that Boer leaders' courage to stand up against this mighty empire and to rally international support to their cause. Isn't it uh, admirable? I think it is. You know, and uh, another thing is that too often, uh, also, also in Russian, Russian, uh, Russian writing, uh, some of Russian writing on, on this war, uh, they say this war was used by right wingers and conservatives and monarchists to distract people from uh, their problems of their of their country, from the issues that they that. The country was facing, so that they would think about some faraway country, about fighting some in some faraway country. But I've also discovered, and I'm writing on this actually. Um, I'm writing a few papers on the, on, the, on it now. That it also inspired Russian left wingers, even Bolsheviks, and it led to a radicalization of the of the Russian society, political, and inspired you know. Mm, development of Russia of, of political consciousness in Russia. So people thought, okay, wait a second, most of us are peasants, and now now they're, they're telling us that, that Boers are also peasants, and they can stand up to capitalist force, which is the British Empire. Well, maybe we can also do that. 
well, they did it quite successfully. Why can't we? And then in a few years time, 1904, 1905, you have the first Prussian Revolution. And there are pamphlets by Bolsheviks with references to the Boer War, to the struggle of the, you know, of the Boer Republics. And then you have Russian um, people, Ru Rus uh, people working in the Russian underground movements, anti-monarchist anti movements, who uh, read about the, the, the Anglo Boer War in, in their classes, you know, developing their polit political consciousness. And I think that's something that's also something worth remembering. That it's, it, it was a, it was another trend parallel to what it was. Both, this theme was exploited both by people on the on the right side and people on the left side. You know, that's I think I, again, it's this war had a meaning beyond South Africa. It's a very very big phenomenon. Yeah, and true. people in South Africa, I, should, I think, should remember that. Oh, absolutely. Uh, but um, Boris, related to, to this question, um, or your answer, sorry, I would like to find out how well known is the Anglo-Boer War in Russia today, and is the role of the Russian volunteers in this war still known? And then um, what sparked your interest in the Anglo-Boer War in Yevgeny? You've mentioned a little bit about it, but uh, if you can just enlighten us on that, please. Yeah, well, I, I became interested in it because uh, that was the time when um, the, the Anglo Boer War was the, was the time when um, South Africa became prominent in Russian popular culture. So that was actually the first time when it when it did. Before that, of course, there were Russian travelers and some educated Russian men who uh, women who read about or wrote about South, South Africa. Um, there were people reading. Or, there were there were adventure novels that gave a romantic uh, image of South Africa. But after the beginning of the war, everyone from peasants to the noble to the Russian nobility was fascinated with the, with 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 the, with that with that conflict and with the, with the, with the, with, the, with, the, with that struggle of the um, uh, Boer republics and um, and of course there's a there's a folk song uh, called Transvaal Transvaal that actually became it's another thing it be, it became it emerged in 1905 it was first published the lyrics for for this song Transvaal Transvaal my country you are you are all in flames Russian folk song. The lyrics were first published in 1905, so that's the year of the first Russian Revolution. Again, and it and it, and and that the lyrics were also part of many songbooks underground uh, published illegally in Russia to inspire um, those underground anti-monarchist movements. Um, so, so yes, well, that's that's how I became interested in in the in the in the Anglo Boer War. Uh, it's 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 a crucial moment. I'm I'm interested in all those um, crucial periods in the history of uh, of Russian South African relations, starting from the 1814, where uh, where um, the Russian Empire was uh, part of the agreement of the uh, of the agreement when. Um, between Britain and, and the Netherlands, where the Cape was handed over finally to, uh, to um, uh, Britain and became part of the, of the British Empire. And Russia was party to that agreement. And all the way to, to the Boer War, of course, and the Russian Jewish immigration uh, to, to South Africa. And, and is the Anglo-Boer War still known in Russia today? Uh, it, it is rediscovered regularly. Ah. So people would read about it on blogs. Some, so some blogger would say, well, you know what? By the way, Russian, some Russians went to South Africa and fought on the Boer side. And here are some pictures and here's the background. And then you have hundreds of comments. Oh, we didn't know that. We're so proud of it, which is unusual because in Europe, the attitude towards this war is quite ambivalent or ambiguous. Yeah. Um, there's a, a book on the Russian, on the, on the Dutch parish in, um, in St. Petersburg. 
before that that existed before before the revolution, and that Dutch parish was at the center of the effort to help the Boers. So people would send money, send donations to to the um, Dutch preacher, the Dutch priest there. And it was a big, big thing. And they raised enough money to um, send a, an ambulance to uh, it was called the Russia, uh, the, the Russian Dutch ambulance to um, the, the Boer republics. Uh, and in that book, which was pu published quite recently by Dutch researchers, this fact that it was the center of this campaign, that the, that parish was the center of this campaign, wasn't, wasn't mentioned at all. There's no mention of the of the Boer War there. Why? Maybe they feel, feel uneasy about it these days. I don't know. Uh, but we don't. <laughs> In Russia, people yeah. don't. Not at all. So um, it's not like it's, it's, it's very well known, but it pops up yeah. now and then. So it, it seems as if our time is almost up. I've got one last question for you, Boris. Um, I just want you to quickly give us an idea on how you went about to compile the book, what mm. did your research entail, and how accessible were these Russian sources to you? Uh, these Russian sources were very accessible because what I'm do what what I've been doing is um, I'm continuing research work by uh, Dr. Gennady Shubin, who passed away a few years ago, and he um, from he worked at the same institute where, where I'm working now, the Institute for African Studies, Russian Academy of Sciences, and um, this actually is a the, this book. The Evgeny uh, publication of the uh, of uh, Evgeny's memoirs is also a kind of a joint project between my institute for Afri uh, the Institute for African Studies and uh, Jonathan Ball uh, publishes. Um, so Gennady Shubin uh, brought out a huge collection of documents relating uh, to the Russian participation in the Anglo Awards, a thirteen volume collection. So he oh, did it wow. with, with 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 his colleagues. And um, it, it contains everything, starting from um, government documents to volunteer uh, reports by Russian volunteers and uh, some works of uh, Russian works of fiction, fiction inspired by the war. And most of uh, Evgeny's account is there, so we we used that and we translated it. And then uh, I also found his various other variants, uh, versions of the same text in elsewhere, sometimes in newspapers and journals and magazines. Uh, because this account, uh, I can't say it became very, very famous, but it was actually, it was the only Russian uh, volunteer account that was very quickly translated into foreign languages. It was, it, it was translated into French, came out in French, and it came out in Polish, but, but Poland was part of the Russian Empire at that time, but still. Um, so, uh, so what I did is, as you uh, quite correctly say, it's a, it's a, it, it is a compilation. We I found all those fragments and I brought them together in more or less cohesive chronological order. But we, but but it's not seamless, so we show where where the cuts are. Of course, we yeah. you know it's separated yes. into intersections. But but I think it forms a rather cohesive. Uh, narrative in the end. Um, so, so that's that's how we did it. And I also want to mention the uh, translator, Lucas Fenter, who um, was, as far as I know, the first uh, Africana to be employed in, in Russia in the late 80s, because he had studied Russian at the University of Batarstan, uh, and then he got permission from the government to travel to the Soviet Union. It was still the Soviet Union in the late, I think, 1988 it was. And he worked as an announcer for Radio Moscow. Uh, he practiced his Russian. Now he speaks Russian without any accent. If you don't know that he's, a, that he's not a native speaker, you will never know it. No. no slang, you know, colloquial expressions. Perfect, perfect knowledge of Russian. And of course, he's an Afrikaner, so he's interested in the history of the end of the war, and uh, he's bilingual, fully bilingual. Um, and he has 
he, he, is, uh, he, he has translated fiction, Russian fiction, into Afrikaans and into English. So we were very fortunate to, 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 to find him and that he agreed to, to, to translate it for us. Oh, that's amazing. Final for, uh, thoughts from your side, uh, Franchian, before we end. Yes, um, I would like to end with a very short blurb on the book that I uh, that uh, that, they, that uh, Jonathan Ball Publishers have added there. Uh, my thought on this book: lucid, evocative, and perceptive. This combat memoir is a delight. Thank you very much, Boris, for giving it it to us. Thank you. I'm, I'm glad. I'm glad. I can see also uh, from from your response and from um, other people's comments, also on social media. I think that people people really liked and they they really enjoyed this book. Uh, even, yes, even though it's a text written so long ago, you know, over a, over a hundred years ago, uh, they. Yes, they could relate to his experiences. They could. They, they, there is life in that text. You know, it's 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 a living text. And, yes, uh, it's good. It's good. Yeah, oh, absolutely. So I think at this point we'll uh, we'll have to uh, call this discussion quits. I want to thank both of you for this uh, uh, good couple of minutes we spent together. I'm I'm sure <laughs> we can talk about this for hours on end, and hopefully we get to do so in the foreseeable future. Um, all that's left to say is I think for those listeners that are interested in this topic, please go out and get yourself a copy of A Russian on Commando and uh, you are sure to enjoy it and you'll be fascinated by Yevgeny's account of his time in South Africa. So thank you very much and goodbye to both Franz Johan and to Boris. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank, you, thank you. Thank Bye. you. Goodbye.